welcome to a new episode of Legends of Bodybuilding. My name is Ben Wellen. I am one of your hosts, and the other one is a man that made Dorian Yates look small. The legend himself, Jean Pierre Fuchs. Hello, nice to be here. Nice to see you guys. And of course, today we have again a very, very special guest. He was Mr. Germany in 2005, he won the world championship in 2000, 2005 and his pro card between 2007 and 2015. He was in the top five at the Mr. Olympia with a third place. In 2014, he won the Keystone Pro, the Australian Pro, the EVLS Pro twice. He won the Arnold Classic in Europe and the real Arnold Classic in Ohio in 2014. Here he is, the big bad Owls, <laughs> Dennis Wolf. Hello. Thank you. Hi, Ben. Hi, Jean-Pierre. Hello, everyone. Hello, Ben. Hello, Thank Dennis. You nice to see you. On your podcast. All righty. Okay. Jean-Pierre, you want to start? All right, Dennis, uh, so nice to finally meet you. Um, you kind of had the career I would have loved to have, you know. <laughs> I was, uh, uh, for Thanks. a very short time, uh, very short time, the best German-speaking bodybuilder, not German, I'm Swiss. Uh, but what you achieved is beyond, you know, this is just absolutely unbelievable. We get to that a little later. Uh, when I researched you, I was clearly fascinated with uh, having grown up in Russia like for 13 years even more, more fascinated German mother Russian father so they must have met somewhere after the second world war uh, in, in, in a short kind of uh, a few short sentences how did that come about they were not exactly friends you know the Germans and the, and the Russians at that time well <clears throat> yes you're right uh, but the Germans uh lived in Russia since 1700s. So they even had a uh, like uh, their own own land, own part of country, which was German. So they never uh, spoken Russian. So they never mixed. So until the Second World War, right? So and Stalin removed them and sent them to like yeah countries or regions. It was all Soviet Union, so one country to Kazakhstan and Siberia, right? So, and since then, it you know they they became part of uh, what do you say, like uh, the whole community in in Soviet Union, right? So then, the the, the Germans and Russians start having mixed uh, marriages, right? So, but not prior to the Second World War, only after. So. And uh, that's uh, also pretty uh, tough um, story, you know. My my grandfather was in war against Germany, right? So and my dad married a German woman. So and I I never saw my grandpa. So I think my dad wasn't wasn't okay to you know let him know, you know. But also uh, he was kicked out when he was 15 years old. And also that's why there was already a bad relationship to his father. Yeah, but that's that's the uh, the history, right? So people mostly think the Germans uh, who live in German uh, in Russia are like uh, you know soldiers left, you know, from the Second World War, but it's not true, you know. Mm -hmm. So they've been there for hundreds of years. Okay. Well, very nice. I didn't know that. All right. You know, so, uh, most most Germans don't even know their own history. You know, they don't they don't uh, like uh, they don't see Russian Germans as German. You know, they call us Russians. You know, so mm, it's right. pretty weird. It's it's just sad that you know Germans don't know the history of their own people. You know, mm. it's it's crazy, honestly. Okay, so growing up in Russia, or should I say? better soviet union did you do any sports from the beginning uh, did you do anything or were you just a kid that was playing on the street well of course i was just a normal kid uh doing a lot of 
crazy stuff. Um, but I started playing basketball. You know, I was, I think I was eight. So I played for a couple of years. And unfortunately, we had to move to another part of the Soviet Union. And it was close to, you know, when the Soviet Union was, uh, how you call it, destroyed from the inside, right? So it was no Soviet Union anymore. So everybody uh, uh, became independent. So, and uh, I was in, in the area of Kyrgyzstan. So they also became independent. So it was close before that. So we moved to Russia and lived there for another two years before we moved to uh, Germany. I was 13 years old, so 13 and a half. So basically uh, all my yeah, young life I spent in uh, Soviet Union, Russia, yes. Okay. So then you started bodybuilding in Germany or what was your first kind of, uh, how did you get in touch first time with bodybuilding? Well, I, I, uh, I get in touch with bodybuilders uh, already in Soviet Union. I was seven year, or eight years old, and um, they used to print in a daily, uh, uh, what is it, a magazine, right? Uh, like like uh, the built in in, in uh, Germany, right? Uh, they used to print the past Mr. Olympia competitors, so it was like a big big thing about uh, Mr. Olympia. So I don't really remember what you, what year it was, but I cut all of them out. So, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I all, always collected the pictures of, uh, you know, of uh, anything I could find and cut out in the magazines, right? So it was like black and white, you know, really thin paper, but uh, I already then um, caught the interest. And then, of course, the first movies with Arnold and uh, Stallone, um, that probably put me in that, yeah, in that direction. Yeah. Okay. But I started, um, I started bodybuilding in Germany, of course. Yeah, I was 19 years old. But before that, I did a lot of different sports, like, you know, try to do, like, all the fighting stuff. and But nothing basically catch so much fire as bodybuilding, you know. I, so, I was just contacted today by my very first trainer. I didn't hear from that guy in 30 years. Okay. And I do remember that first workout like it was yesterday, you know, how, how my life just changed. It was all about that that pump, you know, that, that was yes, just exactly. Uh, this was uh, the reason, I guess, I felt something different because yeah. other sports, you, you, you just got tired or exhausted. Yeah. Uh, but there was no pump in the muscle, right? So, and then like uh, concentrated pump, like chest, arms, you know, legs, it's, it was amazing to me back then. Right. So you started bodybuilding around 19. Yeah. And how long did it take you for your first bodybuilding show, actually? Uh, two years, two years, wow. maybe less. Uh, I turned 21 uh, one week before my first show. So it was a newcomer, so no novice today. And uh, okay, um, so I had to compete with 21. I had to compete and uh, open like uh, what is it? The, I was I wasn't junior anymore, you know. So the times changed now. You can compete until uh, you're 23, well, almost 24, right? So right. <laughs> I was yeah. young, and uh, my first show was right with the uh, in the open bodybuilding. So I was heavyweight. 95 kilos and uh in a novice i uh i ended up second and in a you know in a real open class fourth didn't get my qualification for the uh german championships and a year later i came back and took the overall <laughs> <laughs> so it was crazy people didn't recognize me so uh as soon as i walked down the um uh the stage so i was backstage everyone was asking like who am i you know i was like hey you don't remember i i was with you guys on stage <laughs> last year so that was incredible feeling too <laughs> i was the small guy last year don't you remember <laughs> yeah something like that <laughs> okay, we cool. both won the broke heart the same way uh i won 1994 it was called mr universe then or or mm -hmm. ibb world championships you won in 2005 did you win the overall as well Yes, yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. Was that like in my case a direct qualification for the Olympia? 
No, that was that was already uh, you know from the table. Uh, they they just uh, you know it, it didn't it, like that rule was not not actual then. You know, so unfortunately, <laughs> but uh, I went uh, just five months later or six months later for my uh, pro debut in Texas. Ended up like seventh, and then continued uh, to compete. So I did another two shows. Uh, I did the Montreal, ended up fifth, and in Spain, Santa Susana Pro, I finished third after uh, yeah behind uh, Paco Bautista and Marcus Rule. So I got my mm -hmm. qualification my first uh, pro year. Well, but quickly back to the World Championships, you know. In a that was the show I was always kind of felt like from young on, I'm going to compete in someday, place fifth, place sixth, place seventh, place fourth. You know, that, that was kind of the Swiss way. There is no way you can beat the Germans or Americans. Mm -hmm. I, when I competed uh, in 94, uh, I, I knew exactly who is competing. But it's always the same where guys were in the top six. Uh, one of the favorites was the European champion from Germany, originally Hungary, Nondor Koki was his name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did you have kind of the same mindset going in there, or did you know who's go or you going to win there, or, or was your mindset going to the World Championships? So a year prior, like in 2004, I got beaten uh, at the German Championships, and uh, the winners, they went... Uh, to the world championships in St. Petersburg, I think it was, in Russia. So, and the Russians just destroyed everyone, you know. So, and a year later, when I was going to uh, China to compete at the world championships, uh, in my mind were like, oh, okay, last year the Russians were impressive. You know, they, I mean, they, they, they were home, you know. So, of course, more athletes from Russia will compete. And uh, but ended up like having just one or two in my class, and the rest was like all world championships in other classes. Like, uh, it was uh, Alita Brizi, um, Kamal, the 212 Mr. Olympia mm -hmm. champion, right? So, all these people, I uh, you know, finally, uh, you know, uh, you know, like beaten by you know uh, at the end right at the overall so i was compared to all of them and then uh, if you remember arvid buzek he uh published a, um, a story about me you know and how many world championships uh what you world i'm sorry world champions i you know uh i was beaten at the world championships uh it was amazing you know but i never thought of like oh, okay who will be there or something only the, the the russian because i i saw what what happened uh, the year before right so the german champion who who beat me in 2004 he ended up being 12th or 15th you know so <laughs> and then you 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 basically see yourself okay if the german champion ended up like almost last and he beat me a year before so mm -hmm. yeah but i tried never to focus on on on, on other athletes you know that's good. But you had a big advantage because you had a lot of Russian blood in your body. So <laughs> it, was, it was not like the German guy was going there and winning. Okay, you know, it was fun. Standing, standing backstage uh, at the World Championships in China and the Russian president, uh, I think Ukrainian president, they came by and like and asked ask each other, is, it, is he ours? He's like the other one. No, not anymore. Because <laughs> I was competing for Germany. <laughs> so you won in China like me? Yeah, Shanghai. Wow. I can't That's believe funny. it. It's crazy, That's huh? Funny. <laughs> well, That's really great. They didn't say Jay Cutler because I know you had this long hair, long blonde hair to the back. Yes. Um, yeah, for the Chinese uh, fans, I was Jay Cutler. Exactly. And uh, they were, they've been following me everywhere. Jay Cutler, Jay Cutler. Right. It's like, hey, uh, will Jay Cutler compete here at the amateur show, like amateur world championship? Show? Awesome, yeah. awesome. Okay, I want to go back a little bit. I know as a young painter, you were actually a painter by the age of 20. And I know you walked around in schools with like 265 
pounds. I mean, I want to ask you, how did that feel? And secondly, how did you even still manage to paint? We, we all know when you go overhead and you paint, and you especially when you have big shoulders, all the blood goes in. How, how did you even do that? I mean, you know, me. Ben, I got slower and slower and slower. You know, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> so any type of work overhead was impossible. Well, I mean, it was possible, but I was killing myself. You know, like uh, the shoulder was constantly full, pumped. The old blood was there, you know, and uh, so much pain just doing du during work. Um, right. You know, after a while, I got like too lazy because I was so heavy and blah, blah, you know, how, how it goes. And uh, then start, uh, over, oh, what is it, sleeping, right? So overslept every second day and uh my <laughs> boss got pissed every time and uh you know this is all your bodybuilding and you know so and then he kind of switched my uh my 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 uh direction which what i was doing before right so i was painting right. uh, i was uh putting uh glass into the windows doors so I, I had a fantastic job and he put me on the uh, outside of the wall um uh, what is it um like not just painting but like uh what is it? i call it insulation so we did insulation ah, but yeah, i never so. learned that so you know in all the three years uh learning process you know in germany uh it's called ausbildung so right. you know i learned all the the uh, like fine stuff right so i was right. pro at it but then he sent me to to that uh, work, and I knew that's like the last couple of weeks. <laughs> then he's gonna kick me out because, right? So I, I was so slow, and uh, you know, no experience. Of course, the others will be like saying, "Hey, man, he he's not pr productive enough here." <laughs> so yeah, and then I lost my job, and then I found right. another one. So and uh, and so on. Uh, but basically, I stayed seven years at the same company. And after that, I was already too big to, uh, you know, to to uh, have that as a main focus. So I already kind of start switching my uh, my views, my goals, right. and uh, you know, taking it, uh, yeah. you know, into the becoming pro direction. Right, makes sense. Absolutely. So I have a question here about <clears throat> your work with coaches. Yeah, I mean, that's I think one of the very very big differences between you and i i totally missed that part that i need any help <laughs> i always thought i can do it myself which turned out to be a total disaster <laughs> so did you did you work did you work with coaches already leading up to the world championships or did you just kind of listen to a little bit of everybody and then later as a pro how did it look like and if you had a coach as we all know you did have coaches how how much were they involved in your training I'll say in the beginning, I was listening to almost everyone, like, you know, who was experienced in this uh, area. And, and, and uh, I, I would say most of the amateur time, I was just listening and doing everything myself, experiencing a little bit, experimenting. And uh, yeah, it worked, worked out pretty, pretty good. So I always had a couple of people I will trust more than the other people, right? So it's normal, uh, I, I think. And um, going into the pro um, career, I thought I might not know enough, right? So, and that's why I started working with some coaches. Uh, I worked with Chad Nichols, I worked with Milos, pretty successful. Um, so he, he did crazy, crazy things uh, with me and um i went with patrick tour so but at the end of the day i i i would say i learned a lot right but there's always a better uh way to to learn your body if you, you have uh collect experience right but also you're losing time as a bodybuilder if you're you know not uh going on stage 100 percent prepared right or something went wrong right so there's losing money time and anything else right so but in overall i trust the two persons is dennis james and uh i will say it here martina herget 
uh, if I wasn't sure I'm like too far or not um, in time in my prep, I will go to Arizona visiting uh, my friend Dennis James and, uh, you know, getting a couple of workouts, you know, take him, <clears throat> uh, let him look over me, you know, and uh, uh, give me his uh, opinion. The same with uh, Martina Harrigan. She was uh, the one who told me not to carb load anymore. So stop carb loading. And that's what I tried in the end of my career, you know. So, yeah, that was pretty much it. Like working with uh, three or four coaches. And uh, the rest was just me uh, with, with some help from friends. So, um, uh, although I know it's Ben Stern, but I have a follow-up question on that. So you would just kind of step on stage out of a normal diet or would you still deplete and then at the end of the depletion phase step on stage how, how did that look like yeah i figured that if i was depleted before going into a carb loading uh, uh um status right for two days or so i looked the best and felt the best so i i look incredible and insane in the mirror after a workout where so were you when then, i needed you you know where were you when I needed you? And, and yeah. uh, thinking to myself, like, uh, why should I carb load at all? Yeah. So, and that that was, I think, my big thing. And 2013 was the first first time I uh, I didn't do it. So, and I I looked two days straight, perfect. Um, yeah. I, I wasn't sweating. Uh, I wasn't uh, like fading on stage after hitting a couple pulls. What was happening before? Because I think too 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 many carbs just changed my body like during during the comparisons so i basically you should get better right you, you you squeeze the water out and all that right but i got worse 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 so in the beginning my first call out i was like in the top three and then they moved me out <laughs> okay i only can say Martina knows everything because I know Martina very well too. She's absolutely amazing. So a follow-up question on that. Yes, your best shape came later in your career after you figured out that carbs are not good for you for loading. Was Martina a factor in it? Did she tell you, man, try this? Because you always had a problem that when you start loading, you start to fade away or you got worse from your shape or... When did you figure this out exactly? Yeah, talking to Martina, of course, and also like seeing it in, in the mirror. Like, uh, you know, every time I start carb loading, I just blew up, but the density and the sharpness went away, right? When I hit the poses, like everything was on when I was empty, yeah, depleted. So, you know, but sometimes, like, like I said, at the end of the prep, your brain is not working the way you want it right <laughs> to you know so <laughs> yeah. it, it scares you it, it it puts a lot of sometimes negativity into you you know and then uh, you you just worried and this is not a good sign so that's why i always had like people who will say okay everything's fine or hey you, you're too late or behind you know things like that and uh yeah leading up to that okay. that was uh, the decision i made try it try it without uh carb loading you know i was my carb load was just in the morning a good meal with some carbs not like crazy one just normal meal and then i would uh went to to bed and uh try to stay yeah stay stay relaxed until it's time to go you know and of course olympia is always two days you have to yeah practice it and um look what was working the year before or not you know and uh uh, leading to the last uh, days, you know, before the Olympia, I will try to go uh, lay to bed and stay up a little bit longer and then uh, go up, like, I don't know, 11 or something. So I got closer to, you know, to the evening, right? Because in the morning when you get up, you look the best, the sharpest. And uh, I, I try to do that. But it's, you know, it's tough. I, it might work once or twice, but the rest was just. Uh, <laughs> that's what yeah, I'm yeah. talking about. Experience. Sometimes you you waste time and uh, energy, and of, uh, sometimes it just don't work the way you want it, or the yeah. way you you think it will work. 
That's a very good example of everybody is different, so you should not just listen to this or that. So you have to try everything in order to find out what works best for you. The only thing I wanted to ask you, uh, the last follow-up question on that, how many days did you then go with no carbs before the competition? Three or four or five or how many days? There was It was never zero carbs. Uh, yeah, I know. I, In the uh, morning, you had some. Right? When I understand that. <clears throat> so the week before, I probably will come down from 250 grams a day to 50 the last two, three days. And uh, yeah, the meal um, of, the sh like, uh, of the day of the show will be with just 50 grams in the morning, you know, but a lot of fat, a lot of protein, so it stays, it keeps me uh, full a little bit longer, you know. Okay. So I, I came from a time, you know, I, I followed the 70s or 80s bodybuilders and they trained totally different before a show than in off season, you know, they started to do a lot more repetitions, a lot more sets. Then the 80s came, and I had this meeting with uh, Momo Ben Aziza, who uh, was translated by a friend. Mm -hmm. And he told me that uh, more the opposite. He's doing more kind of the crazy stuff in off season and then keeps it very, very simple, mostly eight to 12 reps, almost does less towards the show. That's kind of what I did then. And I think that part worked pretty well. Did your training change at all off season compared to pre show? Um, training will change like the last six weeks before the show. I will train six days a week, you know, but off season and, uh, you know, the first weeks of uh, my prep will, will stay the same. Just, um, you know, it felt much easier for me to train in the prep. In the off season, I was always like too full. I was too... Uh, I wouldn't say too lazy. I was never lazy, but uh, it felt heavy to train, you know. So, and I didn't, I didn't change much, basically, you know. Yeah, so, like, we all do a couple of changes every workout, you know. Those things, of course, they always been mm -hmm. happening, you know. And I always uh, try to, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, search the way for a better or different stimulation, right? <laughs> so another thing I noticed, your presentation was really great. I mean, spot on, just like mine. Just kidding. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, Jean Pierre, you were oh, among us. You were like when I was uh, looking at your pictures, just to you know uh, put it in there. I I was like, what is this? Yeah, I had the ability to build. On, I don't know. I, I can't even explain it. Just, just to leave it there. So I, you know, I had the ability so you know, to build. You were incredible. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, how much did you pose in the prep, or did you pose all year, or how did that work? Basically, uh, um, the whole prep was, you know, to bring a focus on, uh, bring the de details out, right? So I would say I would start posing eight weeks out every morning, every night, two, three rounds, mandatory poses. And uh, like four to three weeks out, I would start, you know, I will be like, you know, grading up uh, to like two times a day, three times, four times a day when I, you know, like to. But four to three weeks out, I would uh, pose before every meal. So six times. Right before every meal, and then like after the posing, I will eat and I will feel perfect. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. So people told me like Phil Heath is is posing daily the whole day. So and uh, to be the champ, you always gonna listen. You know what people say maybe and what he's doing. But at the time, we'll never ask him. Hey, how many times do you pose? But I will. Um, I wanted to be better than everyone. Uh, and to get there in in comparison, not 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 to break down or look exhausted, you have to practice. And uh, I figured it out a uh, few years after I you know was was in um, in the bodybuilding cir cir uh, circus, right? So practice is everything. You know, training we all can train, but posing, you know, you need to put time in it. Right. 
I, I want to ask you something how it felt actually and I cannot certainly not compare myself to you guys I know I won maybe a world and a universe title but I know when I won my first Mr. Germany junior title I was just 19 I could not even walk over the street anymore I was like elevated People could not even bring me back to earth, you know, because I was right here. Like I saw that was the, the greatest guy in the world. Right. And I, I wanted to ask you, how did it feel to win that Arnold classic in Ohio in 2014? I mean, I can't even imagine how that felt. Tell us, walk us through. It felt amazing, of course, but, uh, yeah, I think at, at, at that moment, you, you just, you know, I was I was searching for words to describe it. You know, when when Arnold uh, was interviewing me, I that was like embarrassing when I watched it, honestly, <laughs> because uh, you we want to tell or say so much, but everything what comes out is, yeah, <laughs> man, I don't know. So, but yeah, it, it felt amazing because I knew I can win it. I knew it deep in my heart. I knew I I can be easy the champion. Right, and then uh, I got beaten twice by uh, my friend Branch Warren, and right. uh, that got me a little bit, yeah, more motivated that uh, it's time, it's time to win it. And uh, when the time was there, I was like, you know, lost the words. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, you know, I I try to enjoy it, but I think because of my mindset, I always kind of try to move look further, forward like you know okay that's mm -hmm. done next one next one next one olympia mm -hmm. but with arnold after that i went on vacation for four days just really just to keep that feeling that finally i i uh, won the arnold classic it's like the second biggest uh title in the right. world of bodybuilding so right. yeah incredible awesome, Definitely. awesome. Did, did you feel after that arnold's you can go on and win the olympia that year of course I did, yes. And uh, I would say I had a great ch a chance to do it, uh, but ended up uh, being fourth. So, but I can explain it how I see it. Like <clears throat> the top three were similar, all similar. It was Dexter, it was uh, Sean Roden, and Phil Heath. They were all similar. And then a big, tall guy standing there twice as big as uh, all of them, right? So um, you are to be first or last in this group. Mm -hmm. I was last, mm -hmm. so easy as that. <laughs> but yes, um, you know, back in the days, uh, winning Arnold Classic will put you right into the mix uh, as a contender for the biggest title in the world, right? The Mr. Olympia. And I felt this way. I really felt this way. But yeah, somehow um maybe it's just uh um should be that way i don't know but uh yeah i was i was going into the prep uh for the uh, for the uh, mr olympia you know with that mindset 100 percent. i want to talk about mental health i know you're a guy who had an amazing metabolism i mean like as soon as the food went in it came right out i mean <laughs> yeah. you had to constantly eat and i heard a rumor i'm not sure if it's true or not i heard that you also also had to puke because you ate too much is that true no no no. i uh no? okay i never puked from from the food i puked once in the gym right and i puked once after my guest posing yes <laughs> but okay. it was hot it was like i was in holland it was like 40 degrees celsius and right. I did like two rounds, I came out, you know, like did my part and then went for another round. And then, I don't know, it was sticky, something sticky in my, my mouth. And so right. I had to, you know, <laughs> throw up, <laughs> but it was it. So I never, I never did that from, from the food. No but, way, no way. But you had to I eat so eat, much, right? right? You had to or eat so much. I, I sometimes I threw up in the morning, like, um, you know, brushing your teeth. Right. Oh, so okay. it was when I was like 140 kilos. That was uh, horrible. And that's why I never went over like 138, 137 uh, further in my career. Yes. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. true. But not from the food.
Right. Okay. Okay. I know Jean Pierre was like 155 at one point or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember yeah, but... Jean Pierre was in <laughs> Hamburg, uh, in that famous uh, gym, Olymp or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I saw the pictures. Oh, holy mother of God! That was <laughs> insane. I know that <laughs> that I was, was. I was amateur back then, right? you know. Yeah, I, I was oh, wow. uh, supposed to win my first pro show two weeks after. Uh, it was it was the first time where the top five were not all also top six in the Olympia. You know, every show I entered, there were not too many shows. You had to deal with mm -hmm. Flex Wheeler, with Kevin, with Nasser. You know, they were always competing because we only had at the night, the champions, the Arnolds and a couple of shows around it. And then the European tour after the Olympia. So there was never even a chance to go to a smaller show. But then there was one in Toronto. Mm -hmm. So I looked at the competitors, uh, Powell, which is great. You know, but it, it it's very beatable, and Milos, which is great as well. But I never had a problem beating Milos up to that point. So I trained like crazy. I was really motivated. Uh, this guest posing in Hamburg two weeks before, and went to the gym with Heiko. I got six in the morning the next morning, and uh, had to do some crazy. 200 pound dumbbell overhead triceps extensions I, I don't know what the hell is wrong with me you know and uh, <laughs> pulled something in my elbow but, but then anyway I went to this show and I depleted harder than ever before and oh. had this idea to carb load with insulin for three days with like a thousand grams of carbs a day I, I don't know I mean I wasn't the smartest cookie out there you know when it came to, came to that kind of stuff <laughs> So, uh, so you, you basically uh, destroyed everything, right? Yeah, so I stepped on stage. Uh, I had all those little guys around me, which I should have beaten easily, and I ended up placing being like seventh or eighth. So after the pre-judging, I called Nasser. I told the story here before. Uh, just quickly said, it's not going well. You know, I, I, I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm very good, you know. And he's like, leave the show. Get out of the show. Get out. Get the fuck out. This is very bad. This is very, very bad for the Olympia. Get out. So I started yeah. complaining about my elbow, which was a joke. It hurt a little bit, but it uh, wasn't that bad and left the show. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. You were faking yeah, well, it. Oh, shit. I got to go. <laughs> that's, that's when you're experimenting, you know. But uh, in your case, you basically get no idea what, what you've been doing. Yeah. Yeah, I was almost arrested at the airport because of an insulin pen. That's another oh story. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, I, you know, I, I did it with Milos, and it worked incredibly good. But uh, when when I got older, over 30, that was not a good choice anymore for me. So no yeah. no insulin, like for the most most time of my career. Yeah, People won't, won't believe it, but I never used it after... After a while, you know, after with Milos and after a while, I did it myself. But then I, I stopped that too. Yeah, my best show was without without any carb loading. I mean, it was an, more of an accident, not planned as yours, because I mm. couldn't load before the '97 Olympia. You know, I had so heavy diarrhea from uh, I think from thinking uh, having too much oil in the depletion mm, okay. phase. and I just couldn't load. I was totally empty on stage and looked by far my best. But then again, you know, instead of me taking a lesson from that, you know, I was like, okay, I, I could even be way better if I would have loaded, you know. So yeah, I just right. needed people around me who, but I only had friends around me who were more scared of me than you can think of, you know, nobody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah no, nobody could really tell me, hey, what you're doing is not working, but, you know, it's, it's all good now. But I have another question here. Of course. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious when we look at modern bodybuilding that you're by far the best German bodybuilder of all time. As I was uh, looking through it, I think there was one who had an even bigger mark on uh, on the world of fitness and bodybuilding uh, from Germany than you, who used to be able to gather 100,000 people to watch his posing. Uh, do you know who I'm talking about? Uh... Thomas Choi? No, 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 no. Uh -huh. Eugene only Sandow. Be only be two, two, two people. Eugene? Remember oh. Eugene? You... 
Okay. Yeah. I've yeah. see, seen some. I've seen some footage. You know, the guy was unbelievably popular worldwide, and uh, people came from everywhere to see him pose. So I would say it's a toss up between you two. <laughs> you know, was the oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know, no, I'm, I'm, that was like incredible time back then. If you just think about it, you know, uh, what was going on, right? Like uh, yeah. body art, you know, muscle, you know, and how far it, it, it developed, you know, it's just insane, you know. And uh, I think it's uh, like a lot of people want to look healthy and muscular and a little bit bigger than usual because that's the strength you're kind of show right and people everybody see it but not everyone can do it right? mm -hmm. and i think that's why the people you know love love that and then um that's why we have so much followers on fans uh in bodybuilding right because it's incredible in first place and uh, almost impossible for the most of the population yeah Right, right. Okay, Dennis, tell us the first time in your life you saw Marcus Rühl live. <laughs> I was, know? oh yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I was waiting backstage for the uh, overall uh, comparisons, right? And uh, it's a small show. Uh, it was uh, like regional show, qualifier for the uh, German nationals. Right. And uh, Marcos was gas posing. I've never seen something like this before. So watching him close, so he was like stretching, you know, in between. And I, I couldn't believe my eyes. I was like, this is this is a professional bodybuilder. I was like, no, no way. You you want to land there? You know, you wanna you wanna go up there? You know, and gain so much mass. Uh, so for for me and and uh, straight to my brain impossible impossible you know so it, it, like sick <laughs> that was just sick <laughs> you know and uh he just came from uh, toronto or something right so he was in uh in his rebound so he was like full blown up you know like incredible yeah that was <laughs> that was like scary to watch <laughs> it, it was uh, very similar when i saw him very similar i was guest posing at the German Championship, it must be, I don't know, 97, 98. So I saw this crazy guy backstage and I I talked, they didn't tell me there's another guest poser. <laughs> you know, so uh, I asked, who the hell is this? You know, and says, yeah, well, he's the, the guy who's going to win the, the heavy or super heavyweight. And he ended up losing the overall. Yes, <laughs> to a lighter <laughs> guy, yes, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I remember he... Yeah. He lost the overall. Uh, people were booing like crazy. Uh, Albert took the microphone after I post. Uh, I was so big. I mean, it was 140, 50 <laughs> kilo. Imagine. I don't know what, you know, it was so big. Half of the people absolutely loved me. The other way, half, you know, they hated how I They were disgusted, right? <laughs> yeah. And Albert said, uh, well, we just all witnessed the death of bodybuilding. Like wow! Wow! <laughs> wow. Oh, that's, yeah, it's Albert. <laughs> wow! That's what they told Marcus. You know what they told Marcus? Ah, you know what, Marcus? We're gonna give you the pro card, but um, and we can't let you win. Otherwise, the people think in Germany you have to be as big as you in order to win the nationals. But yeah, uh, I heard that story too. But I mean, <laughs> hey, this is bodybuilding. It's not like everyone can look like this, right? Right. And not every show is uh you know packed with athletes like this so, <laughs> but yeah it was the same with me they they will give me the pro card they will say oh you have to be uh no you have to compete at the world championships and place to, in the top five then we're gonna give you the pro card so i mean what kind of rule is this yeah <laughs> yeah know. like top five so better better like uh, put it the right way if you have to win so right. that will be for me the rules. If you want to be a professional bodybuilder, you have to be the best amateur bodybuilder. Exactly. So they're like titles you have to win, right? So yep. but it changed, you know, right after. But before and, before and, and today I you get the pro card on every corner. Uh, 
World Championships. They handed yeah. out, uh, I think, pro card to Armin Schultz and Pete Renz. So, you know, no, no, no World Championships. And Ar uh, Armin was junior uh, German champion. I get, I, I, I still remember, but I might be wrong, but it was like that. I was like, hey, why me? You know, why won't you send me to the World Championships? But at the end of the day, I was happy because after that, my name just blew up. Right. Exactly. I, I was quite mad that Dorian and Marcus back in the days, you know, of course, they're deserving pros, didn't have to go to the Mr. Universe. I, I did not like that at all. Not that they wouldn't have won or found a way to win, of course, but I, I never really understood that, that you can just give out pro cards as a national champion. Yeah. And if Ronnie, you see Ronnie it, Coleman you see was the last yourself, one. And you were like close to that. And, <clears throat> you know, it just doesn't make sense. And even uh, right. uh, at the regular regional shows, when you, you know, when I still had to qualify for the uh, German championships, people will tell me like in 2004 and five, I don't get it. You look like a pro almost. And, uh, you know, they, they playing with you and stuff like that because people were uh, getting pro cards uh, without being even German champion. Yeah. Right. I mean, be before the years before I won the universe, every single guy who won the heavyweight or super heavyweight ended up like in the top 10 of the Olympia. Mm hmm. Peter Crazy. Hansel, Mike Christian, Bob Paris. Yes. I mean, they're yeah. all they're all yeah. very great. And now often you right. see in pro cards given out, you never hear from those guys again. Yeah. Exactly. Well, yeah. look, back then when I was a pro, we had like, well, I don't know, 300 pro, but competing maybe 50, 60, you know, and uh, but you 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 know maybe 20 guys at, at max. Yeah. Uh, I, I never really understood the argument, you know. I mean, of course, it's always money, you know, it always comes down to money, but then again. You know, I seen the USA this year, and I remember the days when Ronnie plays fifth. You know, against Matt Mendenhall, against uh, Paul DeMeo. Uh, Paul DeMeo beat Kevin Lebroni, so you were so excited yeah. every year to go see the USA, right. uh, and they kind of miss out on that. You know, so I, I don't quite understand the argument, but it is. You know, yeah. it will not change. You know, I, I, it will not change. Dennis, uh, I want to get into something a little bit uh, less exciting. Uh, you know, we have some, we had some issues in the last few years with some early deaths, which I think could have been avoided. Uh, what was your take on that? And do you think it was always like that? We just see it more often now, or, or how, what's your take on that? No, I think it's a, a very, very scary thing was happening, and uh, it was not happening before. And uh, yeah, well, I think. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to say it, but people got pushed into something um, where they just followed blind into it and uh, did it, right? So the last, who is it, the German uh, famous guy who died? Yeah, he told it like live in a podcast. He was vaccinated and they found something in his blood. So and then uh, a couple of weeks later, he was dead. So... I mean, you know, it's 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 weird what's going on, and mm. what what's the scariest thing is it happens more to the athletes. I think because the uh, the activity is different than normal people. The heart rating is different during training during during normal life. I think that's uh, one of the causes. Yeah, but uh, it's it's showing up everywhere in. Uh, all corners in the world that something is off that that's not normal you know i lost i lost a friend i lost uh many many people i i know i knew right so and uh, they all been vaccinated right okay um talking about something else you got a very special gift when you signed up with bsn as a sponsor tell us about <laughs> what you actually got from them. I think it's very exciting. Yeah, I mean, uh, back then, you you will get a signing bonus that you signed the contract with the company. So my signing bonus was a car. So I could pick any car I, I liked, like uh, like one amount of uh, money. So and uh, I picked the uh, 
Aston Martin DB9. So it was <laughs> incredible. Yeah, yeah. The, the really cheap Aston Martin DB9. <laughs> Very much, yes. Yeah, yeah. But it was not a brand new one, of course. But still. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I thought, look, I when, when I probably get another chance, right? Or right. something like that. And uh, oh, yeah, course. I took it. Yeah, it was it was fun. It was fun, but uh, not an everyday car, not for that price. And uh, of course, like all change is what five hundred bucks, things like that. So right, right, I know. Uh, I not know. not for us normal people. <laughs> right. No, I, I know how it is. I had some luxury cars too. Uh, Ten thousand dollars for a service is normal. Like yeah, you know, crazy. It's, it's crazy. Crazy, I know. All right. I have some at the end, uh, towards the end, I have some questions about your private life, but there is one question we went into it just quickly, but uh, I want you to kind of elaborate on it a little bit more. So you had, the, you had an injury and then you did a comeback. Tell us a little bit more about that. And during the comeback, did you know that you're not as good as before anymore? Or did you just hope this will eventually in some way work out? Um, I would, I would honestly say in when I started the prep for my comeback, I felt amazing, but during the prep, some 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 things got uh, developed that uh, you know I couldn't I couldn't be focused like I was before. Um, appetite was down all the time, basically. You know, I I, I took maybe half of the supplements uh you know what i was taking before and um i i, I start to understand the uh, whole, whole process you know what's happening to me to my career uh when i didn't get like the first the second and third, third call out so i got the fourth call out and i knew okay then it's that's that's the last one you know so just enjoy it and uh do another show because i, I signed i signed up for the uh uh, Arnold in uh, uh, Australia, you know, so and I, I knew right away, you know, that was it. In Australia, I was already kind of relaxed, but full, full with thoughts, you know. I was already thinking, like, what's next? What's next? You know, what I'm gonna do? What am I gonna like start with? You know, so what, like, how is gonna feel, uh, you know, not competing, not preparing for a show? Yeah, very, very um, unusual, scary uh, feeling, and uh, it's 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 uh, it's like it's happening one, uh, everything at once. So you're you're competing, you're focused on that, but then you know, okay, it's it's not gonna be a good place, and uh, you know you you're not looking good, not not as good as you always been, you know. Um, it's 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 crashes you a little bit yeah it's crashes you yeah. did you think about kind of making some changes or, or and try again or was it after australia or you knew before this is it i'm going to do something else i knew it's impossible to to bring back what i lost because mm -hmm. of uh the injury and uh the recovery so i was i was fully recovered but we're speaking about like you know feeling well like have the feeling everywhere but uh during the training it was still like before you know there's no connection no connection like one side was not connecting as the other side still uh without pain you know better feeling but not uh the connection uh i needed or i felt before so there was nothing 100 percent in the whole prep you know and uh the comparisons that gave me to understand like you know that's that's like the last sign you, you know it's that's it mm -hmm. yeah so and How's then i was now? two years i was two years uh really kind of trying to figuring out what should i do you know like I tried a couple things and um yeah i was i was in a negative position like mind wise you know i, I was just totally different for me i was very excited yeah, very, very, oh, very excited. I, I didn't want to do it anymore. Mm. I started to be really scared. You know, I, I, I might die over this, or you know, 
and also I didn't have cost results. I mean, that's that didn't help much either. And I was just then focusing on the animals and I uh, was very excited to start that part of my life. Mm -hmm. How are you doing now with injuries? Oh man, I feel I feel amazing. I still have some issues here and there, uh, depending how, how many people I train. Um, like my lower back hurts a lot of bit sometimes sometimes, like uh, even traveling. So if I if I fly uh, coach really long, man, I need I need a week to recover from that stuff, you know. So yeah, uh, things like that. But basically, that's also the reason why I train uh, fasted right in the morning after waking up is just uh, yeah, stay healthy and uh, feel feel that energy i get in the morning and uh it makes me sharp right away you know and uh yeah gives me that feeling that okay the, the whole day is mine you know i'm done with most important thing in my life it's training right so being active and then the whole day is mine i can do whatever i you know i planned or uh what kind of uh, appointments i have you know and uh, mm -hmm. so it's 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 pretty good, damn good, I would say. Like healthy wise, I feel I never felt better. So and also, look, um, I lost a couple of pounds because I don't train when I uh, fly somewhere and I've been been on you know been be traveling. <clears throat> but as soon as I come back, I start training and uh, you know everything comes back and that's the you know I look like this for two or three years right now. So without changes, I love okay. it. I love it. There's no pressure. There's nor uh like even if i'm hungry and i miss a meal so hunger is what i like and i think that's why i stay in shape so i basically not overeating so i you know i'm not eating enough so that's why i stay there so if i try to get like a heavier two three kilos i just eat for a week <laughs> that's it so mm. i i figured out that you know what i do what i'm doing now is just working for me the best yeah, I think you're pretty happy that you don't have to eat that much anymore because in your career oh, yes. you had to eat <laughs> yeah. a lot, a mountain. But let's go a step back. Uh, how did you get that injury? Uh, walk us through. What happened? Well, um, until today, I still don't know what was the cause, the real cause. But uh, there are many opinions from the doctors. Some doctors say uh, because of my thickness in the neck and the muscles around, you know, and training for a long time, I start feeling it too late, right? So it was already something going on and uh, the calf, you know, was, was starting to disappear in, uh, what, 2010 maybe? And that was already the sign that something was going on in my neck area, right? So cervical spine is like, is like whole nerves are going through and there was already something pinching it but that was so stable i will feel nothing right so right. and when <clears throat> when it started like uh, really like uh hitting me with pain it was when i was uh, uh flying to europe so i was leaning my head back and that was so painful and i thought okay maybe i need a massage and whatever so and then it didn't go away for weeks. So when I was back in, in Vegas, I went to a massage therapist. And after two sessions, I was perfect, right? right. So two weeks later, I start, you know, I, that was uh, back, back day. So we started training back and uh, I did like uh, a couple of rows. And my side would not connect. So one, one arm would go up and the other one would do the you know the movement so and i was like what the hell is going on then i went uh to a doctor you know we did an mri and then he told me that hey so much stuff is going on um on your cervical spine uh, spine even some bone rests were uh pinching the nerve so they were disconnected already broken off and were sticking in, in the nerve so wow. that's that's where the pain was coming from the whole time the whole time yeah, I went uh, under the knife and he promised me, look, I have uh, even a SWAT team member. He is back uh, in his job and kicking the doors in again, you know. So, and I was a great doctor. I said, okay, let's do it. And I felt way, way better after that right away. But, 
you know, it never came back to 100%. And then I spoke to another doctor. He said, if the nerve problem is not uh, recognized for over a year, there is no chance you can bring any uh, all the functions back. Okay. So, and I think that was the case. Too late, right. not like uh, you know, uh, not not straight to it, like to to see whatever it was. But I think it's just too late. It was just way too late. We they, we figured it out. Wow. So your early signs actually was your calves just disappeared. They yeah, just one I think the left calf. Yes. The uh, one side, the inner calf was like gone, you know. And I, I saw that problem uh, by a German bodybuilder, Erich Beil. Uh, he, he was uh, vice world champion in 2004. So, and uh, his whole calf disappeared and, and it looks crazy, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, was, I was having like <laughs> nightmares about this, but uh, I was never thinking about. Uh, that will come from the neck, you know, so. So it's good to know as an early sign for somebody maybe has the same problem, maybe you should they, check. I mean, they, they, they yeah, told me it. that will be, yeah, the case, but uh, 100% that will, I will uh, know from, from, you know, what, what was the case for my issue, All right. you know, heavy lifting. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, of course, heavy lifting, that could be the case, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Your body goes. <laughs> right, right. So, so I, I don't really know much about your private life other than a little bit what I've seen. I've seen you have a wife, you have a son, you have a beautiful no, house. No, stepdaughter. Stepdaughter, sorry. A beautiful house and a Thank crazy you. gym in your backyard. Yes, is, sir. Is kind of <laughs> what, what you will do in the next five, ten years. You're going to just kind of train people and uh, enjoy life or if any other plans. Uh, look, uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, for the words, um, look, I, I have mostly almost every year some plans. Some of them work out, some of them not. Uh, but uh, I think I'm gonna change my life completely. So yeah, I have I have come, a couple of plans, but uh, I'm still I'm still uh, in love with training people, uh, preparing people. Yes, yes, and uh, you know, try to open a gym in Germany and uh, here. Um, yeah, but that was all before the uh, pandemic, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and then on the other hand, I think like, okay, if I would open the gym in Germany, I would be uh, already gone or so, you know. So, all things I experienced in the past, you know, like which didn't work out for me, turned out to be good choices that I didn't kind of, you know, went into it full full time, you know. So. And uh, yeah, that, that's how I see it right now. But uh, I, I, I'm not gonna train people uh, until the end of my life. No. no. All right. I want to ask you about something crazy. Something mm, I would say you almost died. A jet ski accident that happened in Kuwait. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tell us. Tell us about it. Yeah. Um, we were stupid, uh, pretty much. <laughs> so we were in Kuwait. So there was uh, like Dennis James, M Melvin Anthony, myself. Uh, we've been going to Kuwait maybe twice a year at least, just to train there, right? So it was when when uh, oxygen gyms were like, you know, growing on uh, coming up popularity, you know. Right. So nobody knew about bodybuilding back then. So it was 2007. Uh, <laughs> after lunch, we went to the beach and <laughs> rented those uh, jet skis out. So, and went way far out without putting the life jackets on. So, idiots, right? Right. So, and then what happened to me is I, I got a lot of water in my eyes, you know, salt water, not used to it. So, I stopped burning. I stopped, stopped cleaning my eyes and my jet ski flipped because... It was, you know, full with water. It was broken one, right? right. right. <laughs> so no, <clears throat> well, he froze. Yeah. Uh, when you can hear me, 
Dennis, you froze. I guess you have to go in and out. I don't see you guys anymore. Now. I I can hear you. Can you hear me? Go in and out. <clears throat> Dennis, can you hear me? He's probably rebooting right now. Right. Just, just amazingly grateful. My, uh, my, my Wi-Fi and the camera works <laughs> once really good. So now he went out. So I think he will be right back. I got, I got only a. One more really here. I want to ask him about the Dennis Wolf classic and right, where right. This I know. Is, and, and that's and pretty shooting. much all I got. Dennis, I'm there back. We go. There okay, we go. yeah, just, just continue the story on when, yes. when you when you so flipped I was over. Hanging, uh, holding myself on the jet ski, and uh, Melvin Anthony came by and like tell, uh, telling me, ah, flip it over, and I'm stupid idiot. Try to flip it over, lose a lot of energy, like, you know, <laughs> uh, got some water <clears throat> in my mouth, all of that. So, and I started developing panic. So, Dennis James came by quick. He just, like, stretched out his leg. I grabbed his leg. He pulled me over to his jet ski and started talking to me, like, to... He, he understood. He saw it in my eyes. I was, I was panicking, you know, right. and he was talking to me, trying to calm me down. Worked worked out pretty well. So and then when I was calm down, uh, calm down, one like skinny guy came to <laughs> to bring me back to to the shore, <laughs> to the beach. So I got on the jet ski like still afraid, like you know, of the water, you right. know, because I almost drowned. And I grabbed him like that from behind. <laughs> uh, you know, I was big. I was like six weeks out of 2007 Mr. Olympia. I was I was huge. So right. I almost like killed him probably. <laughs> so he, he was Please, driving so hard. back back to the beach. Right? right. So and you know you stopped like I don't know two three meters like 10 feet from the <laughs> from the shore and I was afraid to jump into the water. Can you believe that so much panic was still in me. Right. You know, and nobody understood what's what what what's, uh, just happened, and uh, you know, I jumped into water, you know, got back to uh, the beach, and just lay down on it. And everybody, my wife, we were like, "What what happened?" And like nothing, like I almost drowned. And then they figured out what what was happening. So, at the same night, we flew back to Germany, and uh, I couldn't sleep, and I couldn't think about anything. Just what what just happened. Uh, that day, uh, I almost died. You know, uh, if it's not for Dennis, and I will be there. I will never right. ever use a jet ski in the ocean again, because I I, I went too far out in Turkey. Uh, I was very young, and I couldn't hardly see the I couldn't see the beach anymore, mm -hmm. and I felt like something's underneath me, and I looked oh. down out of nowhere, and it was a coral reef. Oh, right underneath me. I, I, I could have hit this thing, you know, there was no yeah, breeze, was over, no, yeah. nothing, you know, and I, I would got so scared. I was so scared. I, I drove slowly back and I will never, ever, ever. I, the only, only way I'm using it, the only place I'm using it is up in Vegas, but I think that lake is disappearing too with Lake Mead. Huh? It's kind of a little uh, low it's, now. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's it came back a lot of water. Um, right, this year. but then if you had a you had a lot of problems afterwards. I think you could not even take a shower, right? You yes, were... uh, for years, for years, uh, wow. I couldn't take That's a shower amazing. without like having issues. You know, like just washing my 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 head. Like you have to hold your breath, right? I couldn't right. do it, like panicking. <sighs> so every time trying to hold breath, it was too much right. for me. You know, like ah. Uh, even even today, jumping into my pool, it's like almost bringing the the memories back. Sometimes, wow, you know. So Incredible. yeah, it's uh, 
psychologically that yeah almost destroyed me, <laughs> you know so right. yeah but uh John Pierre, yeah you're right uh open water like ocean is dangerous uh place oh, yeah. you can't compare oh, yeah. it to a lake lake no. is more predictable um you know so but still there you know with with water disappearing here uh, like meat you have to sometimes drive like standing just to see you know is there like something like really close to, out. you know looking yeah. out of the water because you don't yeah. see it sometimes if you go fast and uh yeah that that could be your last ride yeah. so my, my wife she had recently the last ride she had an accident uh, she flew from the jet ski uh she was making like 65 miles it's it's a lot so and uh mm. yeah she was hurt for two weeks wow. yeah my, my wife will not sit on my back i uh, she flew through the air in a turn i just seen her <laughs> she flying has, like she freaking. has her own jet ski she drives <laughs> really? so fast yeah <laughs> but uh look <laughs> uh some some couple seconds you're not concentrated not focused shit like this happened and you know you could be dead so it's it's I, like a motorcycle i always know, tell it'll... people it's like motorcycle it's not fun what you think yeah. even if i like if you see my videos i drive fast it's like 70 miles per hour but i'm concentrated it's just a short short time you know and i know where i can do it you know right so yes motorcycle or jet ski is as you know can be can be deadly yes yeah then then it's a few years ago i tried to get a show to switzerland like something like a jp fuchs classic and uh, as i kind of planned the whole thing out the meeting with robin chang and the manians I, I decided that that's it's a little much you know especially since i don't live in switzerland and then uh, a friend of mine took over uh, Cotty Flag, she's doing a great, great job now with uh, the Swiss Classic. So your show uh, is doing very well, and would you like to expand that to other countries, or what's the plan on that? Yes, um, we, we we have the Dennis Wolf Classic uh, for three years now. Uh, the next one is going to be next year, uh, April 6th, in the same place, Bochum, in Germany. Yeah, I would love to extend, uh, but uh, it's not always that easy. Yes, um, you know, I love doing this. It's it's a completely different uh, part of me, you know, like being promoter. Uh, yeah, it takes your, yeah, every year you you're, uh, learn something new and uh, try to make the show better. So, and uh, I think we've been doing a great job. So from the first one, to the third month or the third was the best and we were sold out each time so i try to put a show on which is just a regional show but i want i want the show to be like like almost like a pro qualifier uh the quality must be there you know like the people uh, i want the people to enjoy not just uh, the time there but also like everything surrounding that show you know the guests um you know uh perfect uh stage presentation all of that you know and uh i'm lucky enough to work with great sponsors and uh yeah who knows where the uh, the the uh journey goes but uh i, I would like to extend of so course. yours is a pro qualifier huh? pro qualifier yes it's uh, it's a big question uh but i don't think in germany maybe somewhere else yes Mm -hmm. okay but like i said i uh um you know this is this is uh i'm still uh, happy with my show but uh pro qualify is another level and mm -hmm. uh so i need to, i need to ask for that uh, but uh i'm not doing it in germany all right so dennis you are a big shooter i mean you love guns <laughs> right i see like, all the like videos the most, when you, when you like run around in the Americans. desert and you shoot and with automatic weapons and whatnot and and you have a lot of fun right definitely yes definitely <laughs> well my friend okay. is uh i mean he's full into it and uh yeah i'm glad he's he's uh you know always practicing and uh, i'm going with him uh, as much as possible yeah so but look uh it's it's the same like uh with, with, with i think motorcycles something like that you you never 
forget it, you know, how to drive and how to use it. But uh, you get you get like rusty. If, if you right. don't shoot for two, three weeks, man, you need like an hour to be like the same, you know, <laughs> it's, right, it's tough. Right. So, but uh, I need to practice more. I would love to practice more, but sometimes just, you don't want to drive an hour and an hour back and that's the whole day, you know, sometimes yeah, I just sure. don't want to spend the whole day on it. Right. But it's a lot of fun. I remember when oh, I used to live in Arizona, I was shooting a Winchester 1956. And you see in all these Indians and cowboy movies, when they do this, uh, yeah, no, not happening. <laughs> no, it's like... <laughs> exactly. The kickback is like, kill you. Yeah, kickback man. is badass. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. So, but, so next uh, time I'm in Vegas, friend, I'm going to get... Uh, Artum, uh, I'm an amateur in this. But look, um, I'm practicing, so that's important. So next time I'm in Vegas, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a workout in your gym, huh? Hit me up, definitely. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah let let Ben send send you my number. No problem. Very absolutely. good. Thank you so much. No oh yes, you are very welcome here. <laughs> yeah, I was I It'll was so nice excited workout. to do this. Great. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Anytime. All right. I think uh, we through more or less. I guess. Very good. Thank you so much. Perfect. Yes. Oh, uh, thank you, gentlemen. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, and of course, uh, Jean-Pierre, uh, talking to you for the first time ever. I mean, very, very nice. We, we always like being bodybuilding fans. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's just because of the injuries, you left too, too early. And uh, right after that, I was there. That's why we never met. Well, we did right. now. And let's keep yes, that up. That's exactly. great. So, but it yeah. doesn't have to be the last time. Okay. So when Absolutely. you're in Vegas, same with you, Ben. Let me know. You can always train here. A hundred percent. Thank you so much, Dennis. And uh, yeah, two of the best German-speaking bodybuilders of all times, Jean-Pierre Fuchs and Dennis Will. Thank you so much for coming. Dennis. Okay. Very good. Thank, Thank you. Thank Goodbye, you. Bye, guys. See you Bye -bye. later. Bye-bye.